All right, good evening and uh, welcome to yet another weekly forum from Smart Karma. As we do every week, um, uh, while we wait for attendees to stream in, I'm going to briefly run you through our disclaimer and we'll also recap some of the ideas that we discussed in previous weeks. So first and foremost, um, just um, letting everyone know that the weekly forum is strictly for Smart Karma subscribers. It's meant purely for informational purposes. It does not constitute investment advice. It is the opinion not of Smart Karma, but that of our inside providers. And lastly, but quite importantly, Chatham House rule applies to the weekly forum as well as most of our webinars. And that means please do not share any of this information on any public forums or social media without express permission first. Um, and with that, I'm going to quickly move on uh, to recap some of our recent forums. Uh, so last week, uh, in our large gap section, we took a look at Toyota Motors. Um, you know, Japanese autos have been a sector that Smart Karma research providers have favored since December last year. And we've always spoken about a barbell, you know, owning the largest name, which is Toyota, and also owning uh, probably a higher beta name like Mazda on the small end of the spectrum. So with Toyota, we've been uh, really, really invigorated to see them uh, beating our earnings estimates across the board, revising guidance, and most importantly, buying back stock. Um, this is something that we notice across quite a lot of the large cap companies in Japan this year. They're increasingly shifting their attention to uh, be and becoming much more minority friendly. Secondly, we also took a look at Alibaba. Alibaba is a name that uh, we put back on the radar uh, after it had fallen post uh, increasing regulation around their space. Um, we revisited the name right after results to see whether you know, anything had changed versus the original thesis. And the conclusion was that uh, Baba actually looks better and it's also cheaper. So in a way, holding the faith here. And large, lastly, in our thematic section, we spent some time looking at what might be the biggest uh, tail risk for markets, at least in this part of the world, which is a, a risk of military escalation from China into Taiwan. The week prior to that, in our small cap section, we looked at Razor. This is a Singapore tech company that's listed in Hong Kong. It's a stock that's done very poorly since IPO. It was a name that the research community on Smart Karma disliked quite unanimously at the time of IPO, but is, is now turning positive on it. Um, and again, once again, it was the buybacks from the company that really caught our eye here. In our large cap section, we looked at JD Logistics upcoming IPO. Uh, it's a big IPO and we actually, today we saw pricing for the deal towards the low end. And we also looked at the read across from that on its parent company, JD.com. And thirdly, um, one of our insights that's gone truly viral and, and literally no pun intended here uh, was uh, SPARS versus COVID. For those of you who might have missed the forum, SPARS was a fictional uh, pandemic uh, that was written about three and a half years ago by the Johns Hopkins Institute in the United States. And there are extremely eerie similarities between that write-up from three years ago and the, the pandemic that we see ourselves facing right now. And uh, this is actually the most read insight on Smart Karma this year. Uh, and it's an insight that has drawn a lot of attention uh, globally. And it's an insight that we've actually moved beyond the paywall and made available for that reason. And the reason we discussed it on the 13th of May is because uh, now, based on where we are right now, where a large percentage of the developed world population, especially in the West, is vaccinated, we wanted to look at what was it in that fictional write-up that happened next. And, and that's what we discussed at length on the 13th of May. Now, just, just for listeners, you know, we, we record all of these sessions. And in case you want to spend some time binge-watching the forums, we can make these recordings available to you just write into us at uh, plus at smartcomma.com and we will, you know, my team will share these with you. We've seen a lot of you actually writing in and, and, and also sharing some good feedback. So we're really, really, we're really happy when you make it a two-way street in terms of feedback and also asking for these recordings. 
uh, we're actually going to uh, lift our game starting July. We're taking the month of June out. There will be no forums in June. Uh, and during this time, we will be incorporating some of that feedback that we have received over the last few weeks. Also, when we recap these ideas, we, we also look at how these ideas performed uh, you know, over an arc of time. So starting December 2020, which is when we began the forum, you know, we track um, what each cohort of ideas has done since then. So what's interesting here is none of the ideas is closed. You know, so some of those have gone up and even come back down. We assume every idea is equal in terms of size. So this is not a portfolio, but it's sort of equal dollar value. And this is just the average. What's not here are ideas that are thematic in nature. Sometimes it's very, very hard to capture those accurately or, or comparably across the board. Um, and you can see, um, you know, of course, and you know, the more recent you come in time, let's say if you're looking at you know, ideas from April, you have to give them at least three to four months to start to kick in. So, but like this, we're, we, we are very, very, I guess, objective in looking at you know, the, the, the sort of the quality and performance across the board. Now, um, moving on, uh, the, the agenda for today is very straightforward. In our small cap section, we will be revisiting straight trading. It's actually an idea from uh, our earliest of forums in December. It's an idea that's done really, really well. It's, it's vastly outperformed market performance. And we continue to be very, very constructive on this. So we, we will sort of re, I guess, reassess how things look now. In our large cap section, we will discuss the upcoming IPO of Zomato in India. This is the first Indian IPO that we are featuring in the forum, but it's, it's probably the most important IPO uh, for India at the moment as well. And lastly, in our thematic section, we will be looking at uh, China versus crypto. And, and, and the, sort of the big three letter question there, why? You know, why is China against crypto now? Um, and you know, this is really an opportunity for you guys to ask questions for that use the Q&A button. Uh, we will also happily take questions on ideas presenting, presented in previous forums. We might not be able to answer all of these questions and uh, those would be posted as discussions on the platform. So let's dive straight into the first idea. This is straight trading. Just to get a few facts right, this is a Singapore listed company um, the market cap is uh, about 826 million US dollars. So it's a small cap. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, it was in November when we started talking about the idea that that first green circle stock price was just under a dollar 60. Today, the dollar, uh, today the share price is about $2.70. Um, this is uh, a name that trades under a million dollars a day. So it might not be the world's most liquid name, but there are sort of clear reasons why we, we sort of get excited about it. So let's recap that. So straight trading is all about its hidden investment in a company called ARA. And we call it an old gold idea because it's actually a very, very old company. Straight trading as a company has been around since the colonial era, at least about 100 years. Uh, it owns a 22% stake in a business called ARA Asset Management. ARA used to be a listed company in Singapore, but it was privatized about four years ago. Um, during the privatization, um, you know, Warburg Pincus, which is a big private equity firm, took the majority stake. Straight trading took about 22%, and there were a few other investors that came in for the rest. Uh, ARA, uh, for those of you who might not know, it's in the business of managing real estate assets. So it's like a manager of REITs. So if you guys like REITs, then you will love ARA because ARA is basically REITs without volatility. Uh, so these sorts of assets get very, very good valuation in the markets because it's, it's a pure recurring revenue fee income business model um, with very, very long contract cycles and very, very good performance incentives. So ARA is, was, um, you know, What's interesting with ARA is that it's grown really rapidly during this time when it has been a private company. And that growth in market cap and valuation is really not captured in uh, straight trading's current 
market cap. And, and, and that's why we call it the hidden crown jewel. So what's new? The latest thing is just a few days ago, ARA announced that it has raised $500 million. That's a lot of money, half a billion dollars from uh, the Japanese bank, SMBC, Sumitomo. Uh, SMBC has joined as a strategic shareholder. And to us, this, this smacks of a pre-IPO funding round. It, it implies that the IPO is around the corner. Uh, David Blenner Hassett, who wrote an insight on that soon after that, uh, concludes that either the biggest shareholder, which is a family office called T-City, either they will privatize straight trading, or you're getting an unbelievably compelling indirect in, uh, investment into the upcoming listing of ARA. Now, I think if T-City had to privatize this company, they would have done it at $1.60. They would not have waited. So the more likely scenario is that you're getting, you're getting a backdoor discounted entry into ARA. You know, this might be the most compelling way to front run the IPO of ARA uh, that could exist. Now we're not alone. Um, we were alone at $1.60, but at, at $2.70, we're not alone. The DBS uh, ha has initiated coverage. They've written a few updates. And if we're not wrong, the target price is about $3.90. But there's a lot of uh, upside scenarios in their report. And I would, I would sort of encourage you to take a look. Their report is actually uh, publicly available. Um, you can just Google the word DBS ARA and just see what they think. Now, DBS tends to be uh, a banker on pretty much all Singapore IPOs. I think that's one of the core reasons they've initiated coverage. But will DBS be the only company that initiates? I highly doubt so. We think that there will be multiple local banks and international banks that will start to cover the stock as we get closer into ARA. Now, here's, here's another exciting update, right? Ming Tiang Di, which is a real estate focused um, publication. It's a very well respected publication. Their cover story this morning from this morning is that ARA has now surpassed Capital Land and it is now the biggest real estate fund manager in all of Asia Pacific. Not only that, in their words, the IPO is also around the corner. So let me read verbatim from their publication this morning. As it lays the groundwork for a public listing, Singapore's ARA asset management can chalk up another milestone, overtaking Capital Land to become the biggest fund manager in APAC real estates by assets under management, according to data compiled by a group of nonprofits, yada, yada, yada. ARA's AOM accounted for 67 billion, up more than 9%, blah, blah, blah. Now, we, we, we present a very conservative valuation here for all the assets. Um, you know, David concludes that we're trading at a 40% odd discount, but I've got to say this is, you know, this valuation does not give you the sort of premium that ARA will likely get for being the largest real estate fund manager in APAC. So with that, uh, you know, this is open to questions if you have any. If not, I'm just going to keep moving on um, because the forum is designed to be very sort of quick fire, open mic. Zomato, this is going to be India's largest internet company to IPO. As you can see, interest level on the platform has skyrocketed as the company approaches its IPO. And that's a big reason why we're looking at it. So a few key points. Zomato is looking to raise $1.1 billion in its IPO. I think I mentioned this, this will be the largest listing in India from the tech sector. Uh, in fact, to be very precise, the internet sector. There are very, very few internet companies listed in India. And as such, this will get a big scarcity premium. Now, what does Zomato do? Zomato runs a tech platform that basically matches restaurants, customers, and delivery partners. Right. So in the pre-COVID world, you could use Zomato to book your table when you were going to the restaurant. In the post-COVID world, they're doing a lot of delivery. So in the, uh, uh, in the financial year 2020, uh, Zomato served 41.5 million people uh, per month. You know, that's a massive, massive number. They have presence in about 526 Indian cities and they have 350,000 active restaurants listings. 
their revenue grew nearly sixfold over the last two years, but this has lagged the gross order value growth of 8.4%. So what that means is there's a lot of very low value, low dollar value orders on the platform. Now, Amongst the different types of revenue that Zomato makes, the fastest growth has come from food delivery. I think that's quite obvious given you know, the pandemic situation. So food delivery revenue is up about 16 fold in the, in the two years from 2018 to 2020. Uh, what's interesting is that the company has really invested behind this growth. So their advertising and sales expenditure has grown even faster than growth in revenue. Uh, you know, that's 16 fold and 47 X. I think what that means in the future is that they've, they've really gone after market share and there will come a time when they scale back on these costs and you start to see profitability coming. For us, what was quite exciting is that their take rate. So take rate is the percentage of the revenue that they get to keep. It used to be about 11% in 2018 and it's grown. It's nearly doubled over the next year to 21%. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, the number of restaurants is shrinking quite dramatically, even in India. Um, you know, the company is raising, you know, uh, between, like, let's say close to a billion dollars. Uh, they already have about $600 million on their balance sheet. So they will be a very, very cash rich company. And as you can see on the exhibits on the right hand side, uh, you know, at, some of these uh, expenditures have already started to stabilize and hence profitability come back. But right now it won't be profitable at the time, obviously. So the clear picture here is very high growth company, dominant leader. They've actually in fact uh, expanded beyond India as well. They will be you know, consolidating this whole market and they'll be focusing a lot more on profitability as we go forward. Okay, so I've got some questions coming in. Uh, the first question is, straight trading is essentially a hold call play, but hold calls usually trade at a discount to SOTP in the long run. Uh, will such a discount take away from the potential price? Yes, that's, that's very, very accurate. It is a holding company. It will always trade at a discount for that reason. But the question now is this, right? Um, imagine a super hot IPO, the hottest real estate IPO. And somebody comes to you and says, hey, if you invest in straight trading today, it's like getting access to that IPO at a 50% discount. Would you take that or not? And that's what you're playing for. Okay, this, will, this is the only way at the moment to front run the opportunity uh, of being a shareholder in ARA, but at a very deep discount. What happens in the long run could deviate very much, you know, ARA could go up a lot post listing because they continue to grow in size uh, and, and straights might be the cheapest way to play that. So I think this can unfold in a different way. Yes. Will it trade at a discount? Absolutely. Will the discount be as big as it today? I doubt that. Will ARA's valuation be as conservative as what David or our other insight providers have factored? Probably not either. So I think that that's, that's the other side of the argument that one has to consider, but good question. Thank you. And let's move on to the last section for today. Uh, so the thematic section focuses on what's been a pretty hot topic. Uh, you know, we've seen cryptocurrencies take a real beating and hence we're taking a real look at China versus crypto and why, uh, you know, Will it really mean that the world moves to the RMB as a reserve currency? No, uh, definitely not. But let's take another look at this. Key points. So last week, uh, or I think maybe the week prior to that now, China uh, surprised the world by banning its financial institutions as well as payment companies from providing any services related to cryptocurrencies. Uh, they also sent a pretty stern warning to all investors in China against speculative trading in crypto. This led to, you know, uh, most cryptocurrencies falling quite dramatically. Under such a ban, uh, all institutions that are regulated in China, including banks, online payments, they are no longer allowed to offer clients any services whatsoever, including crypto. 
I think we've got to stress China is not alone in this. There is a very good reason to believe that the SEC in the US is next to announce restrictions. Uh, uh, we got a clear lead of that last night um, when uh, Gensler, Gary Gensler, who is the uh, most recently appointed head of the SEC, came out and issued a very, very clear directive that they will uh, be much tougher on their oversight for cryptocurrencies as well as SPACs. So here on the right hand side are, is a summary of what he announced. So first thing is he told lawmakers that SPACs and digital coins posed significant policy and investor protection questions. Secondly, he said crypto enthusiasts who uh, have been hoping thus far that regulators are more accommodative, they should be disappointed. Third, he raised concerns about crypto exchanges as well as decentralized financial platforms. Again, this is a very hokey stance. Fourth, he went on to say that he wants to bring the same level of protections to crypto exchanges that stock investors would get on you know, traditional stock markets like NASDAQ or NYSE. So this is, this is clearly a very, very hawkish stance. Um, but again, this begs the question, why? You know, why is it that regulators are you know, stepping the ante? The most obvious answer that people would come up with is, hey, well, it's because there's a lot of speculation and hey, because you know, there's a risk that people will lose money. All right, but is that the only concern? It might not be so. Um, I think behind the scenes, regulators are working very, very hard to launch GovCoins, which are government-backed digital currencies, as opposed to decentralized cryptocurrencies. Um, I think uh, this cover from The Economist uh, is a real signal that that is, a, that is a here and now situation. Secondly, one must get ready for the e -Renminbi the Fed coin and the e euro. These are all currently under development, but not just three. There are at least 50 different regulators which represent bulk of global GDP that have all in one form or another initiated workflows to unroll their own digital currency. China is the leader in this. They've rolled out their e renminbi pilot to over 500,000 people. I think the number has actually grown beyond that. Euro is a bit slow. They plan to launch uh, the virtual euro by 2025. Britain is even slower. Uh, they've got a task force. America is uh, still talking hypothetics. So, you know, China definitely has a lead here. And I think before long, you will get the e renminbi fully up and running. And once that happens, once you've got a government-backed cryptocurrency, I think there is, a, there is a very, very strong reason why the regulators will become a lot more hawkish on uh, currencies that are not regulated. Uh, that includes all cryptocurrencies. So we wanted to just present this as a compelling argument to you know, watch out for developments uh, in GovCoins. Also, in this little economist cover, if you look at the first article, Rise of the Creator Economy, that represents everything smart karma. So there's something positive happening with smart karma. Uh, with that, I'll take more questions. I've got, let me see, um, none of those at the moment. So either I've done a very, very good job or you guys are feeling shy, or you just want to send in your questions through discussions on the platform. But either way, um, you know, this is your chance now. Uh, it's not limited to today's forum. It can be on any of the previous ones. But if there are no further questions coming in, then I'm going to wish you uh, all the best for the coming week and month. We will reconvene in July with the next forum, which would have incorporated a lot of the feedback that you send us over the course of the last few weeks. With that, thank you very much for your attendance today. And we'll speak soon. Bye-bye.